problems of that sort. Uh, welcome. It's absolutely lovely to see old friends and new uh, popping up on screen like this. And I'd really like to um, thank you all for coming and to say that, you know, we can still have a sense of community. We're all still here. We're really keen to be in touch. You know, do get in touch by us, with, uh, with us by any means that you desire. So this whole event is basically the creative writing staff. Um, we're going to read for you. We're going to introduce ourselves. Some of you will know us all too well. Others won't know us. And it's a nice way to introduce ourselves for the future as well to other people who might look at this recording, which we hope to keep. I think everyone should have given their permission um, to be involved in that recording. So we've got a real diversity of people in our department and a real diversity of genre material for you tonight. Uh, prose, poetry, life writing, script, um, it's a lively department. Even the poets are extremely diverse, not one is like another. Um, and um, it's quite a relaxed and informal place and this is going to be a relaxed and informal event. Uh, sorry for the slight technical hitch for those of you who came early. Um, every single event that I have been to in the last few weeks has begun with people sort of frowning into a screen and a slight technical hitch. But we've all come through and enjoyed each other's presence nonetheless. So um, I'm going to hand over to, to my colleagues in a minute and we're all going to do a very short set for you, which will consist of us introducing ourselves, saying what sort of thing we're into, uh, what kind of writing we do. Also, what we've been doing during lockdown, which I thought might be interesting to people, you know, whether that's released people's creative energies or what, or what kind of writing they're engaged in. Um, and then we're going to read. So everybody's going to do about, you know, between, I gave the prose writers more time. Those of you who come to our events regularly will know there's a lot of amusement about, you know, the prose and poetry uh, readers and how much time they have. The prose writers have got about sort of eight minutes and the poets have got about five minutes to do a very, very short reading and to give you a flavour of our department and the sort of stuff that we're into. Um, so I'm not going to pop up between every single person because I think that's going to be awkward with the muting and the unmuting. What I'm going to do is I will introduce the next person and, and then that person will introduce the next person and we'll go on like that until we get to the end. Just so you know where the end is, the end is Connor O'Callaghan and after that we'll be open to questions. Um, I suggested at the end we um, unmute ourselves to ask a question and go for the old-fashioned raising your hand in the screen rather than and trying to use the little the little controls because uh, we've all found that slightly easier. There's also the chat where you can write comments if you want. Um, after the event, you know, you can get in touch with us by the old fashioned method of email that feels ancient now or Twitter or any other other method you like. So I'd just like you all to relax as much as you can in your own homes and surroundings um, and enjoy the evening. I'm going to hand over to Shelley first um, because she is the course leader. Uh, I'm going to invite her to unmute herself and to tell us a little mm -hmm. bit more about herself. Thanks, Shelley. Well, thanks, Harriet. Yes, so I'm uh, Shelley Roach-Jakes and I'm the course leader for both the BA and the MA creative writing courses at Sheffield Hallam. And if anyone uh, watching wants to get in touch with me to find out a little bit more about the courses, then please do get in touch and we'll give uh, our contact details again at the end. Um, so, yeah, to tell you a little bit more about me, um, I generally teach modules on the craft of, of writing poetry and fiction. Um, my specialism really is the dramatic monologue, uh, which is a type of poetry. Um, it's a type of poetry with its roots in the Victorian period, and it's most associated with the poet Robert Browning. Um, but although it's poetry, it's really, the dramatic monologue is really concerned with story and character. Um, so a couple of years ago, I think now, um, it dawned on me that if I'm so interested in story and character, then I, maybe I needed to branch out from poetry and start writing um, some prose. And I found myself writing flash fiction. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with the term flash fiction, it just means short, short stories, basically. Um, anything really under 1,000 words counts as flash fiction. Um, so as a form, I think it works well for me, um, perhaps because it has some of that brevity and economy of uh, poetry. And I just like the way that I can kind of keep it all in my head. It's sort of on one page usually, and it kind of, I can kind of get a sense of it all at once. Um, so during lockdown, I've been um, 
working, carrying on working towards a full collection of science fiction, what I hope will be a full collection of science fiction. Um, and the piece I'm going to read for you in a moment, um, I, I started writing it last summer, I think. It's a piece of about 500 words long. And the main feeling I got when I, when I took it out again to think about which piece I was going to read for this evening was that I, I felt like the characters in it really take their, their freedom to go out and about <laughs> for, for granted. That was the thing that struck me. Um, the piece is called um, Alison and Simon to the Dark Tower Came. Um, the title is a reference to a, a Robert Browning poem. And <laughs> people that know me will be thinking, oh, Shelley, just leave it with the Robert Browning, will you? But I just wanted to say it doesn't really matter if you get that reference or not. And then, yeah, it, any, the piece should be accessible to anyone, I think. Um, it's a dual perspective piece. So once it gets going, um, each time a section starts with Alison, it's from her point of view. And each time one starts with Simon, it's from his point of view, um, as should hopefully become clear. Okay, so here we go. Alison and Simon to the dark tower came with the leaflet from the visitor center. He hadn't lied, that lopsided fella in the wax jacket who had pointed with his stick over the stile and straight up through the woods. This pyramidal tower com commemorates the defeat of the Jacobites and was erected in gratitude to King George II. Alison listened as Simon read from the leaflet. He somehow managed to make it sound like something he knew already and was explaining for her benefit. She peered into the dark entrance. The tower stands 30 metres high, and those brave enough to enter and ascend the 150 stone steps to the cupola can enjoy 360 degree views. Simon watched as Alison disappeared up the few, first few steps into mossy dimness. Typical of her to leap off ahead without a second thought. He began the ascent, leaning into the wall and concentrating on his breathing. Every so often he came to a narrow window with a space to sit down, but thought it best to press on, keeping his eyes focused ahead. Alison emerged into the light, the light of an overcast Wednesday afternoon in April in the mysterious province of Rotherham. How magical. She zipped up her fleece and peered over the edge of the railings. It looked a long way down. Simon counted his outbreath. Four, five, six. He reached the final step and stood there in the stone doorway, holding on. Alison strode over and whipped the leaflet from his clammy grip. It unfolded into a kind of map with compass points and arrows showing landmarks it was apparently possible to see. York Minster, 33 miles northeast. The woman in the visitor's centre had promised that one. It seemed unlikely. Hooton Roberts, five miles southeast. She could see a cluster of stone houses, so if Hooton Roberts was a village, that could be it. A stupid name for a village. Simon started to get used, of the f used to the feeling of being up high and to relax a little. The railings were far too low for comfort, but if he kept his back to the wall of the cupola, he could make his way round and enjoy the 360 degree views. It was hard to make out the various objects on the horizon. If he'd been allowed to buy those smart little zoom binoculars with 7.5 degree field of view and 2.5 meter close focus, it would have been easy. But no, apparently he had enough stupid gadgets already. Alison thought she felt the first drop of rain on the back of her neck. Oh, to be in England now that April's there. Yeah, right. Oh, to have booked that gorgeous house in Florence on Airbnb. But no, he wasn't sure about flying and you can't trust internet listings and the pound wasn't looking too good against the euro. Simon edged back round to the doorway. He'd done it. He hadn't chickened out and spoiled things by being overcautious. Now they could make their descent, find a nice tea room and enjoy a hot beverage and a big slice of cake. Alison put the water bottle to her lips and took a slug. A drink, yes, that's what was needed. 
Now they could find a cosy pub and enjoy a steak and a large glass of red. Thank you. I'm, <laughs> I'm now going to pass over to the next reader, who is Chris James. Thanks, Shelley. <clears throat> my name's Chris Jones, and uh, my main interest is teaching poetry at Sheffield Hallam. I work at all levels, from first year through to MA and PhD. I spend a lot of my time thinking about how to make this engagement with poetic form accessible and stimulating for students, my fellow writers, so that they want to explore what words can do on the page, how they can articulate their own experiences. Confidence is key in this respect, giving people the resources to be creative, but also showing them that they have loads of writerly skills already. So during lockdown, I've been reading a lot, a hell of a lot of books, books that I'd forgotten that I'd had catching up on. In terms of writing, I'm inching toward finishing a long narrative sequence of poems that I've been working on for the last four years. I'm writing the penultimate poem at the moment, which takes the form of a long letter from the narrator, Pete, to his son, who lives a long way away, the other side of the world. In practice, it feels like I've been working on a 5,000 piece jigsaw of a cityscape, but without the box that has the widescreen picture on the front to help me out. I've got to the point now where I can see the image clearly and also make out the few bits and pieces that are missing and need filling in. The collection, I hope, will be out at the end of this year will certainly finish by the end of this year. So I'm gonna read you two poems, not from this sequence, but from the publication Matter. And I've got an old copy here, very old copy here, that I found in my attic. Uh, it's an anthology of writing. Each year, uh, our MA creative writing students put together an anthology of writing, featuring lots of different writers. From, from locally and, and around the country, well-known writers, uh, student writers, BA, MA. So I was invited to contribute last year, and these are the two poems that were printed. The first poem, To the Man Who Dropped His Baby in the Cafe, is imagined from two points of view, like, like Shelley's piece. So first from the man's, point of view and then from the woman's perspective to the man who dropped his baby in the cafe your wife may forgive you she's crying now outside face blown like an umbrella too drained and ragged with shame to start a row though when you nudge the door to tell her how all fingers thumbs you are She'll come round to check the graze on her daughter's ear. We'll rock her since this girl roots her to the ground. But what she hangs on you isn't so clear. When Paul let go of Tia, you can recall the bruise that lit your gut, your vomit braided hair, asking what he meant by little fall. You plot a path from his shoulder shrugging air. His offhand answers to almost everything, like who he'd texted, where he'd gone and when. To the night you called him out about the fling. How you vowed he'd never touch you ever again. And the second poem I'm going to read uh, requires no introduction. First and last. The one time your mother kissed your thin, dry mouth, your head was somewhere west, 
across a field that stank like fever after weeks of drought. The river's stony bed all but revealed, and you pollen-coated, sunburnt, t-shirt ribbed with sweat. A stretch to say king of the lame, though who else tasted dust above the bridge? When distant clangs you heard passed as a train. Cochineal, ponytail, jasmine scent. Once she'd pinked your bottom lip to stop the talk, you bugged yourself with asking what it meant. Like when she murmured through partition board a name you couldn't place. You thought to buzz back at the wall, bend in and hear her speak to ghosts, acquaintances, absent lovers from all the bricked up rooms she'd found in sleep. Thank you very much. I'm now going to hand you on to, to Yvonne. Thank you, Chris, and hello, everyone. So um, I'm Yvonne Battlefelton, and I do have mine typed up because my memory is um, not always that great, but just a reminder for, to me of what I wanted to say. So um, I teach creative writing and creative industries here at SHU, and I am a creative writer. So I write short stories, and I also write for children. I write creative nonfiction and also adventure for children. For adults, I write um, contemporary short stories, and I've written historical fiction and I also write creative nonfiction. Um, I'll talk to you a little bit about my novel in a second. Um, not only do I write and teach and mom, but I also um, I host creative uh, writing events, literary events, because I actually I absolutely need those in my life. And so for lockdown, it's um, I think I'm remembering how much I need people. It's that intimacy of having people in the room and talking to them and building connections over words and stories. And so like a lot of people, I'm trying to do that now online. And so it's, um, it's an interesting experience and it's, um, it's a moving and I think also a humbling experience as well because I was getting to know Sheffield and I was getting to know the people and its places and its stories. And then now I'm finding just different ways to do that. So I'm also doing, um, I think attending a lot of events around the world right now. And so it's, um, it's a really interesting way to connect by going to events in other places. So um, let's see, at Sheffield Hallam, what I try to inspire students to do is to, one, to write the stories that they are most passionate about, um, what they're interested about, and that might be about seeing stories set in wherever they live or characters that are like them or that have things or that are as important to them um, and they're important to the students and maybe their community, wherever that is, whatever they represent, wherever they represent, wherever they call home, or places they're curious about. I also try to encourage them to engage in the wider community. And that might mean um, going to where they were from or where they live now or a community, um, however they define community, I try to engage, encourage them to engage in that. I also try to encourage people to create events because sometimes the things we need in our lives, um, they're not there yet. And that's okay. That just means that there's a place for you. And that place might mean that you are the one who is um, bringing these projects to life. I'm a big fan of getting what I want. And so I think I try to help other people to one, figure out what they want. Because it's no fun just getting anything, right? But I'm trying to get to help them to figure out what they want and then inspire and empower them to go out and find it or make it happen. So that's um, a little bit about, I think, why I do what I do outside of the classroom and why I do what I do inside of the classroom. My biggest, I think, goal would be to have each class feel like a community. And so I feel like that's something that we work on together. So we would be building that sense of um, belonging and acceptance, that sense that you can try new stories, new words, new places, new characters and adventures, and you have a supportive network to bring that about. So a lot of that network is, of course, my colleagues. And it's also your peers in the class. And so you sort of get out of it what you put into it, but you're encouraged to put things into it so that you can get something out of it. Um, so I said I wrote this and then I haven't even read this. So what else? Uh, let's see. When I write, um, I write 
about diverse characters and underrepresented characters. I write about hidden stories and silenced voices and secrets because I love a good secret. And I love sharing or telling a good secret probably as much as I love having one. But I am one of those people that if I have information, I have to tell it, I have to share it. So secrets are no good with me. So um, I tell them in my writing, but then I also tell them um, if I know something, I try to share that with someone else because I just, I love doing that. And it's empowering for me and also empowering, I think, for people who are looking for information or um, want that sort of thing in their life. I write a lot about family, community, home. Um, I write to increase representation, champion causes, draw attention uh, to causes, learn about people, to learn about myself. I write to learn about where I am and really to figure out who I am because that's what reading gave me. So um, growing up, I feel like reading made me a more empathetic person. And it reminded me that people have different um, interests and different needs and motivations that are unlike maybe what I think they want or need in a situation. And through books, it reminds me of these things and to maybe ask questions, but also writing does that for me as well. So if I'm faced with an, a question or a problem and I'm not sure what to do with it, I start writing. And that reminds me that, okay, you know what, actually other people need other things and other people want other things. Um, and it reminds me that people have motivations and obstacles and challenges. And so it gives me hope and um, it makes me a better person. Um, I'm not sure who I would be or how I would be if I wasn't writing. But let's see, what else do I do? So part of my role is creative writing and creative industries. And again, that's about community and inspiring community on and off the page. And so what am I writing right now? Um, I was supposed to be writing my next novel. I was meant to be writing historical fiction. I was really interested in, um, in the US and in 1919, which they call the Red Summer, which was a, um, a season of um, horrible racial tension and violence and massacres. And I wanted to kind of write through that and to kind of understand what people might have been um, grappling with and considering and how that might have, um, how that's still going on today in different ways and formats. And I would sit there and start writing and I just, the words wouldn't come. And I'm not used to that. Like I don't have time for writer's block. And so um, I was kind of like, well, you know, what's going on? And I know that we're in, a pandemic and I was thinking okay so maybe writing writer's block is a real thing and then I'm like no that's actually not it so the problem wasn't that I couldn't write it was that what I wanted to write wouldn't come so what I needed to write right now was more of mysteries and part of that is because I started out writing murder mysteries there's nothing like a good murder um on the page of course so um I started out with that curiosity and trying to figure out who did it, why they did it, and if they'd get away with it. And that's the same thing that interests me when I'm writing. And I think just the times that we're living in right now, it forces me or empowers me or encourages me to look again at the human experience and to look at what people are capable of. And that's sometimes very good and sometimes very bad. But it right now when I'm writing, it lets me kind of question that. And so what might these characters do? Um, now granted, part of that was because I was writing and they just kept dying. And so um, I think they decided it was gonna be a, a murder mystery because I was starting to care about these characters and they wanted me to figure out who was killing them, how they might stay alive. Um, and so some of the ones who most wanted to know, well, they'll never know um, because they're dead. But uh, so yeah, so sometimes it's not writing what I think I'm going to be writing but it's writing what I'm inspired to write. And I'm finding that amazing. And it's so freeing and fulfilling to just see where the story goes and follow it. So um, the novel that I wrote is called Remembered. And it has been um, long listed and short listed for some fabulous prizes that I'm really excited about here in the UK. And then it's published in the US in February, 2020, where I'm hoping that it's gonna find it's like, um, it's home and pe with people and places and, um, reviews and, you know, awards, and of course, you know, a movie one day. But anyway, so um, it's the story of a mother whose son has been beaten by police in 1910 Philadelphia. That is the present. It is told over 24 hours, and in those 24 hours, you see 24 years in the U.S. Um, 
slaveholding past. So you get to meet characters who are enslaved and then you get to follow some as they are emancipated. So I'm actually just gonna start right in the beginning of the book. I'm reading from the um, UK copy. So it's the one with the beautiful blue cup. And to set the scene, it's 4.30 in the morning. So we're tired and we are in Philadelphia. She's sitting there on top of the shiffer robe, rocking back and forth, swinging her legs in time to some music she heard 10, 20 years ago. She is like that, Tempe. Get something stuck in her head and it stays there like a thumbprint in wet cement. I want to ask her what she's listening to, but I haven't had on. I know she's there. I can feel her watching me, smoldering, hating me for ignoring her. It serves her right. It's been nearly a year since the last time she came. She can just sit there brewing and rocking and waiting on me like I've been waiting on her since then. Mama's dead, she had said. It was fall. She popped up in the middle of the kitchen and plopped into my favorite chair like it was hers. Like she'd been there all along and hadn't wafted it in smelling the cinnamon and cedar wood. Always burning, even on a crisp autumn day. She strummed her fingers on the kitchen table, fingered the cracks, waited. I turned back to the ham. Had to get supper ready in case Edward came home looking for some little bit to eat between shifts. She didn't care nothing about my ham drying out, my biscuits burning, or my heart breaking. I couldn't think of nothing worse than having my dead sister sitting in my favorite chair talking about my dead mama. Mama been dead, Tempe, I told her. Wasn't a knee turning a facer. I knew her eyes would be burning a hole in my back. She just now died. She snapped her fingers. It sounded like twigs breaking. I wanted to ask her not to do that no more. You just thought she was dead. I knew she wasn't. If you knew she wasn't dead, why wouldn't you tell me? I asked. I based the ham and pineapple juice and honey, put the biscuits in the hot box, tidied the tea towels. When I couldn't think of nothing else to do, I turned around. The look on her face said it all. Why would she have told me? We've been keeping secrets since we was little girls. Why would death change that? I'm gonna read just one other short section. So I skipped forward just a few minutes and she's still there and Spring still wants her to wake up. Spring is of course dead and she's her dead sister and she, whenever she comes, she's the bearer of bad news. Hurry up. I'm up. She sits on the edge of the bed. I wanna reach out and touch her, to hold her, but she's wispy like smoke. She's old. What's the use of being a ghost if you still get old? All these years and she's still on fire. You still mad, Tempe? If I could change what happened, I would. You know I would. The air crackles. I should have saved her. If I had gone back all those years ago, pulled her out of the house, she'd be alive or we'd at least both be dead. A warm hand above my shoulder. Get dressed. I pick through dress after dress. Too flashy, too homely, too proud. If I knew what I was dressing for, I would know what to wear. The dresses are segregated by event. I flip through work, visiting, entertaining and celebrating. The sweat slips down my neck. The room gets hotter. Soon I'll be at the last dress. Please don't let me make it to the last dress. I skip over consoling. Holding my breath, I reach for the long, thick black dress in the back. Not yet. I breathe the thick woody air, swallow the salty lump that rises from my belly, and get dressed. Hope. I haven't worn this one in years. And now I'm going to pass over to Andrew. Hi, 
Hi everybody, I'm Andrew. Um, I teach on creative writing modules and on English literature modules. Um, and one module I really like teaching on is uh, called the writing room and that's where students get to bring whatever they're working on to a workshop and get to um, work on it either as a group or individually with me. So I get to see the wide variety of work that's produced and as you can hear from this event, like writing can take you anywhere and that's fantastic. Um, I like to work on writing projects. So I've recently completed a PhD, which was a long writing project, mainly in poetry, um, involving writing about the environment and nature, going on, going on trips and bringing back collected words, collected images from where I've been and fitting it all together. Um, I also like working with other people. So during the lockdown, I've been with my um, partner in lockdown. We've been going out on our daily mandated exercise and looking at all of the signs in, in and around the area of Sheffield we live relating to, um, to the pandemic. So mostly that's the shops that have closed. And what I've realised is that I really miss our local shops in the area that I live and how important those local shops are to the community. So um, this piece is um, a celebration of the local shops of wood seats through the language of those shops, which is mainly the signs that they've put out during the coronavirus pandemic. Um, yeah, so here we go. During this difficult time, we are sad, we regret. Sorry, sorry, we are sorry as precaution. Sorry for inconvenience. We are truly very sorry. We are closed until we can welcome you Back in the future, we are now delivering. Contact us on Facebook. Catch it, germs spread easily. Always carry tissues and use them to catch your cough or sneeze. Bin it, germs can live for several hours on tissues. Dispose of your tissue as soon as possible. Kill it, hands can transfer germs to every surface you touch. Clean your hands as soon as you can. Please do not leave donations outside the shop due to the current situation. Our reduced menu is cooked at high temperatures and boxed hands-free. We will no longer be providing magazines during these unprecedented times. Thank you so much for delivering for my son. We are very grateful for help at this difficult time. Thank you for saving my sanity. Keep safe. Thank you. P.S. I will post on Facebook as well. No cash or stock remains. Remote alarm monitoring and CCTV in operation, Weatherspoon. To protect our staff, volunteers and customers, please do not enter the shop during such rubbish time. Protecting your best interests remains central to everything we are doing. If you feel unwell during the COVID-19 pandemic, we would like to reassure you that we're doing everything we can at this time to protect staff, volunteers and customers in all our shops. We are following the advice of the government and Public Health England. In worrying times, follow us on Facebook and Insta. I'm on lockdown, living by myself and finding it hard. And my sweet delivery has really cheered me up. LOL. As a minimum, hands should be washed. When you get to work, at least every two hours at work, before and after eating, when eating, use very clean or disinfected crockery. After using the toilet, after coughing, sneezing, always into a tissue, which is then binned, or blowing your nose before leaving work when you arrive. Home hand sanitizer is not mandatory if good hand washing is done. If you wish to use hand sanitizer, a personal bottle may be carried. Avoid unnecessary physical contact with colleagues and customers. Giving a customer their change is fine. Avoid touching your face, nose and eyes. Wash your uniform after every shift in this time of crisis. P.S. I will post on Facebook as well. Still supporting our customers for breakdowns and urgent installations. We are open for business. Upon arrival, please call, remain in your vehicle and await further instruction due to the current circumstances. We'll be temporarily closing our doors to our community. Government regulations make it clear that an owner taking a pet by vehicle to be groomed is unlikely to be essential travel. However, there may be welfare grounds on which grooming may be necessary, particularly if the lockdown persists. Mobile groomers may continue to operate, providing that they maintain social distancing the owner retaining all equipment, such as leads. The grooming facility must be thoroughly disinfected between pets. Groomers whose business relies on pets coming to them can continue to work if they collect them, and as long as they can disinfect their vehicle between collections. And then only, one, only pets from one household should be collected at one time, 
Only one dog, maybe groomed at a time, and the dog should have left the premises due to you know what. For 115 years, our commitment has been to support our community. We may be closing our shop doors, but you can still shop with us online or over the phone. We still offer a delivery service, ensuring things are as safe as humanly possible for all involved. We will observe all guidelines and social distancing rules at all times. If you know anyone who needs extra support with anything, we will do our best to help. Prescription collection, food runs, kettle cooker, washer emergency, or just someone to talk to. We will do our best to be here. We are waiving our delivery fee. No children, no pets, one at a time. Caution, 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 caution. We are here to help, so please follow this away from other shoppers. Dear parents, the government has issued other guidance. Many children may still have personal belongings at school, including PE kits and coats. We will be in contact at a later date to arrange a suitable time and place to collect these items, should you need them. Shop solo if possible, one adult per trolley. I will see you all on the other side, hope for safe, and most of you looking like Chewy, but at least getting your money's worth. Help, thank you so much, thank you, stay safe, thank you for delivering. Amazing, thank you, stay safe. I just want to say thank you. I never intended for this to happen. Thank you for your continued support. Cheers. Nice one. Tarduck, mercy, help us, help you. Save money, live better. Thank you. Uh, I'll pass on to Hattie now. Hello. Hello, everyone. Um, so, um, I'm just going to... Ooh, can you hear me? Can you wave? You can hear me okay. All right, great. All right. So, um, I, um, I teach screenwriting on the, on the, uh, on the creative writing programme. Uh, and you have an option of doing it three times while, uh, while you're with us. Um, uh, I always teach the introduction to screenwriting, which gives you, uh, which is basically about story and how we put story together. I believe that everybody can write, given the right conditions and the right environment. What's interesting about writing for the screen is that it's terribly technical. And if you teach people those tools, then it's accessible to, to everybody. Um, and I believe that quite passionately, which is why I teach as well as uh, I'm a script writer, I'm a professional script writer and that I'm, that I'm not perhaps more than teaching. I'm a part time tutor on the on the courses here. Um, so I write on a commission basis, so I do about five plays a year. That's quite a lot. And I might reel off what I'm doing, but it's quite um, dauntingly large. I'm, I'm very lucky in that I can write very, very fast. And also I would argue that script writing is, um, because I've been doing it for so long, I've been writing for about 20 years or so, it's something that just falls through me uh, uh, now. One of the joys of teaching it is, is really to understand the technicalities of writing actually, which I have enjoyed, I enjoy teaching as well as sort of going over and over again as I, um, as I lecture. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what I've been doing. So I tend to write, if there's anything that all the work has in common, I tend to write about the outsider and the dispossessed. My agent calls me the most flexible of his clients, which you can take, I think, either way as a compliment or maybe not. Um, so my work is really, really varied, which you can be if you're a scriptwriter. So um, at the moment, you can see a few things which are online at the moment. You can see... Um, I think you can still see Lack and the Dogs, which is a film that Andrew Cotting made of a play of mine, which I'm going to read in a minute. I wrote the text with him. Lack and the Dogs was uh, in the London Film Festival in 2017 and went on general release in 2018. And I think you can still, it, still see it on BFI Player. At the moment, his new film is definitely on movie, which is the whalebone box. Both of them, uh, Andrew, uh, uh, Mark Commode is a great big fan of Andrew's work, and it's really worth looking at his reviews online before you see the film. They're sort of high art. They're comp it's like a sort of, uh, it's a bit like Derek Jarman, a little bit like Tarkovsky, and he, he, did, he makes these extraordinary films. Um, so he took my play, Ivan and the Dogs, um, uh, which has probably been the most successful of my plays and was Olivier nominated and has now been performed all over, all, all over the world. And he adapted that into Leck and the Dogs. 
Um, so that's on at the moment. You can see that. What you can also see at the moment is a, is a play called As the Crow Flies, which is very different. It's a play by a company called Pentabus. That's online at the moment. Um, and that is about a woman who adopts a crow. It's a small, smaller piece of work altogether. Um, and it's really about bereavement and time, but quite funny and entertaining and there's songs within it. But you can see that online at the moment. It's on until I think June. Um, in the moment, I'm, I've just delivered a radio play, uh, a sort of psychological thriller. I've not written one before uh, about uh, a woman that is sort of haunted by a young man who, who believes he's a bird. Um, that just been delivered to Radio 4 and we'll be recording that, of course, after the lockdown at some point. And that should go out, I think. I think it was due to go out in autumn, but I suspect it will go out in next year, next year now. I'm also being commissioned to do a... Uh, television pilot for what will be perhaps a series um, about the restorations about Charles II and some, from Samuel Pepys's perspective. Um, and what that means that they, they've commissioned, the company will have commissioned me to write it and then they will then try and sell it to organisations like Netflix um, and Amazon Prime and so on. Um, I'm also, I'm uh, the main writer for a company called Extraordinary Bodies. We're an integrated disabled company um, that uh, specialises in circus and theatre. So half our artists have disability. So, for example, we have two blind aerialists. Just think about that for a moment. Um, and they're both female. So it's an incredible company to work for. And they've commissioned me along with another writer to write a play um, about a freak show set in Nazi Germany. And that's a, a commission with, between them, Brislovic and the Lyceum in Edinburgh. And that will be dramaturged by quite an extraordinary writer called David Gregg, who some of you might have come across. Um, so that's all due to happen probably two years in that time now, because it, it, everything's been obviously put back because of the lockdown. Uh, I'm also, so this is quite endless, I'm also doing a musical for Storyhouse based on Brewster's Millions. Um, I had, I just, I delivered a play early on this year called The Marxist in Heaven, which is, which, which, commission, which was commissioned by the, by National Theatre Connections. Again, that's been put back and we'll go into the Dorfman uh, in June, I hope, next year, um, which is the National Theatre Space. Uh, and perhaps one of the things I'm most excited about, which is the least paid I suspect in the end um, is going to be a um, news well, uh, a version of the Aeneid. I've been approached by a company called Dash Arts who specialise in site specific work and really amazing sort of uh, uh, alternative theatre work I'd say you, you'd say um, and we're working on a version of the Aeneid with Virgil's you know fabulous poem um, with a, a jazz composer called Maruf Majid, who's an Iranian refugee. Um, and what's also very exciting about that, uh, Maruf's music is quite incredible, is that he lives in Finland, so all the r and is going to be next to a lake just outside of Helsinki. So I'm really looking forward to that one. So that's, and there's some other bits and pieces I'm doing. So I'm, I'm doing a Goethe as well, I think, for Radio 4. So I, I just... I'm very lucky to be so employed. It means that the lockdown has been quite, I, th I feel bad about saying it's been good for me, but it means that I've been able to really concentrate on all these commissions and not spend my time on trains. So I've probably taken up too much time already. So I'm just going to read you the very beginning of Ivan and the Dog, which Ivan and the Dogs, which um, would take maybe 30 seconds. And this has been probably the most successful of all the plays. Um, the person, this is normally performed by a young man. It can be performed by anybody, but I probably got the wrong accent for it. The very first person that performed it in this country was a Polish immigrant. And uh, so he performed it with, um, uh, with his own uh, native accent. Um, and that worked very well. And it was recently on at the Young Vic in London and they, they chose a, 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 um, a wonderful actor that, um, uh, that had a London estuary accent. So it's my accent is sort of too posh for it, if that's all right. So if you can imagine someone else's accent, then I will, um, I'll attempt to read it. Okay, so this is the first, this is the very beginning of the play. So, all the money went and there was nothing to buy food with. Mothers and fathers couldn't feed their children or their animals. 
mothers and mothers and fathers tried all sorts of things to find money to buy food but there wasn't any because all the money was gone so mothers and fathers tried to find things they could get rid of things that ate things that drank or things that needed to be kept warm they looked about their apartments for these things the dogs went first they took them in their cars and drove them to the other side of the city and left them there. But still there was no money. So mothers and fathers looked for other things, other things that ate and drank and needed to be kept warm. And some children were taken to the other side of the city and left. Then I was four, four. So I can't remember everything because I was very little, but I will tell you as much as I can. I will tell you as if it's now. And this is now. Thank you, thank you. Um, and I would like now us to move on to Jo. Thank you, Hattie. Uh, hello everybody, uh, my name is Jo Dobson uh, and I'm a second year creative writing PhD student uh, and my PhD uh, is about the role that nature plays in trauma literature um, and it's in two parts and the main part is um, a memoir that weaves the story of my childhood together with the present day story of restoring an allotment in southwest Sheffield um, from a neglected and overgrown patch which it used to be to a space that can hopefully produce loads of vegetables uh, but also um, the aim is that would be full of biodiversity and very welcoming to other species um, that also have a claim to that space. Um, and the PhD here at Sheffield Hallam, it also involves um, quite a substantial piece of critical analysis that needs to kind of work symbiotically with the creative output. And for this, um, I'm focusing on the figure of the exiled child in some novels about the Second World War. And in particular, the way that nature is interwoven with the representation of trauma in those books. And I really like the interaction between critical and creative work and the way that one can feed the other. Um, and so I've very much enjoyed teaching this semester on a module called Writing Environment, which is a creative critical module that looks at all kinds of issues in the environmental humanities and encourages students to produce both creative and critical work that engages with these issues. Um, I've also found that doing a PhD has brought me other opportunities to write that I wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, and I recently started a collaboration with a composer who's interested in storytelling and electroacoustic music. And the idea was that um, we would produce a piece of electroacoustic storytelling focused around my allotment. Uh, but literally, just after we got going, the lockdown was declared. Um, so we haven't been able to meet up. Um, but actually it's worked out quite well in a way, temporarily anyway. Um, so Julia, the composer, she's been going to my allotment and making recordings there, um, which she uploads to a sound count. And they're really lovely, they're really therapeutic, they're like birdsong and water and, and um, uh, she calls it um, uh, outdoor listening for, for the indoors, you know, for, to help people who are stuck indoors. So she uploads those um, to her SoundCloud and then I've been writing an occasional blog that is a response to some of those recordings and I write it in the form of a letter to her um, and we're calling it a quarantine conversation um, and we'll just see what happens, <laughs> you know, uh, it depends how long this goes on and we'll just see what, what develops, it's quite exciting really. Um, but what I'm going to do now is I'm going to read you something from my memoir that I'm writing for my PhD uh, and it's about the first time that I ever saw um, our allotment uh, with my partner Julian. It was a hot day in mid-July 2014. We'd been wandering around the site for a bit, trying to follow the directions we'd had on the phone, when at last we stumbled on it, guessing it was the right plot because it was covered in pale gold, waist-high grass. Facing down the slope from the main path, there was a large greenhouse on the left, with a few straggly tomato plants growing out of builders' bags full of soil. On the right was a small shed and a pair of blue water butts, Nettles had grown to half the height of the shed and goose grass was flopping into the water butts. Between the shed and the greenhouse, three brick steps led into the main part of the plot, which then ran gently downhill towards a sycamore hedge. 
We could just about make out a path through the middle and on each side of it, a faint outline of vegetable beds beneath the swathes of grass. On the left, the boundary with plot 24 was marked by trees that I hoped might bear edible fruit in the future, along with a prickly hedge that would turn out to be blackthorn and towards the bottom, a tangle of brambles. In front of the greenhouse, a long bed edged with a low brick wall was choked with nettles, bindweed and strawberry plants. Where the sun caught them, scores of ripe strawberries were winking through the weeds. I stuffed one in my mouth, pressing it with my tongue until it exploded warm, sweet and juicy, like a strawberry from a storybook. Meanwhile, Julian was beating a path to the bottom of the plot. Come and see the gooseberries, he called. I found him in a patch of fruit bushes in the bottom right hand corner. Bindweed was rioting here, twining thick round every stem, sporting huge lily white flowers. But the gooseberry bushes seemed undeterred, dripping with pale green fruit, swollen, delicately veined, bitter in the mouth. As time went on, I would learn that the allotment is always both now and not yet. It is as though it exists simultaneously in at least two different time frames. There is the now allotment, the one you have before you in the present, and then there is the not yet allotment that lives in your head and is a complex swirl of dreams, plans, hopes and predictions for the future. Already, just minutes after setting eyes on this plot, I was beginning to create the not yet version, the one where the grass would be shorn low, the beds clearly delineated and full of ripening vegetables, the trees heavy with apples, pears and plums. What I wasn't thinking about, not then, was what my attempts to control the way the plot grew might mean for the other beings that also had a claim to it. We'd arranged to meet the current plot holder, Colleen, on site, and she arrived after about 15 minutes, an elderly woman with a pronounced limp. Oh, what a jungle, she sighed. We said the council had told us she might want help with harvesting. No, I knew they'd get it wrong, she said. I need to give it up. I'm just resigned to it now. Every time I come down here, my hip flares up for days. You can have it. I'll tell the council. Just like that, this patch of land, 360 square metres, we would learn when we got our first rent bill, became ours. After Colleen had left and Julian had gone back home, I sat for a while at the bottom of the plot, peeping through the long grass, trying to take it all in. The sun was warm on my back. There was a faint smell of hay and I felt like a feral cat or maybe a fox, half asleep, half alert in its lair. A wren trilled insistently behind me. When I turned my head, it darted from the hedge, a flick of brown. I could hear the traffic on Hanging Water Road and in the valley, a man was calling his dog, his voice amplified across the water in the dam. On the edges of the plot, clumps of comfrey with nodding pinky blue flowers towered above me. Brambles arched from the hedge, thick as a baby's wrist and studded with thorns the width of my little fingernail. There were bumblebees floating between the comfrey blooms crawling inside some, then gliding onto the next. Two tortoiseshell butterflies worked a spiralling dance just a few feet away. In amongst the grass, I spotted ragwort and groundsel, thistles and teasel. Closer to the ground were dandelions in every stage of growth, tight green buds, bright shaggy flowers, and the ethereal globular seed heads that we used to call clocks and blow to tell the time. Puff, one o'clock. Puff, two o'clock. Puff, three o'clock as the seeds floated around our heads on their tiny parachutes. Next to the fruit bushes was a six inch oak seedling that had grown up beside some black currants. Its leaves were already on the turn, rimmed with crimson and burnt orange. It probably came from an acorn cached and then forgotten by a jay from the woods in the valley. I had read that jays, like squirrels, bury nuts for winter food, up to 5,000 in a single season, sometimes working 10 hours a day to lay down a store before the soil freezes. I was getting stiff from sitting on the ground. I needed to get home and cook tea. As I left, I nearly bumped into an elderly man on the path. He was wearing nothing but a pair of khaki shorts and some dusty trainers. Sweat glistened around the white hairs curling on his chest. Are you new? He asked. I told him yes and pointed out our plot. That was the star allotment once, he said. Everybody knew it. The woman who had it, she was in her eighties and she used to come down every day. She grew prized chrysanthemums in the greenhouse. He went on, are you organic? In a tone that suggested I might have a communicable disease. 
For a moment, I saw myself through his eyes. Idealistic, average height woman in her mid-fifties, grubby jeans topped with an old and baggy t-shirt that clashed with her bright red cheeks, highlighted hair sticking out from a sweaty scalp. Er, uh, yes, I replied. Well, you'd have to use something for the slugs, he said, then nodded and went on his way. So, thank you very much. And I'm now going to hand over to um, Harriet Tarlow. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you, Joe. Um, I'm Harriet Tarlow, as Joe says. Um, I teach at Hallam. I've been here since 2007. Uh, I teach at all levels, uh, particularly interested in poetry, writing and environment, um, and also experimental writing. So I teach on two of those modules. I also love supervising research and I've had the sort of joy and pleasure of supervising Andrew who read earlier and Joe who's just read now. So that's a great enjoyment to me. Um, and it's interesting that uh, I found myself drawn to reading a piece that has bindweed and found text in. So you can see how well matched we are. It's got sort of found text like Andrew was using and bindweed like, like Joe's been writing about in her piece. Um, so a lot of my writing is environmental, but it's, it's basically poetry um, and academic writing um, that I do. I'm also really interested in cross-disciplinary work so I work a lot with artists especially the artist um, Judith Tucker and do lots of sort of exhibitions and artist books with her. Um, what have I been doing in lockdown? I asked everyone to answer this question and I thought oh no I'm gonna have to tell them what I've been doing in lockdown. I've been sneaking out of the house early having one more walk than I should have in order to write about birdsong. Um, because I've been asked to contribute to a book that's about the dawn chorus. Um, the dawn is getting earlier and earlier, which is actually getting harder and harder for me to get out to the dawn chorus. I'm sort of, I start hearing, I think, great, I've got to get out of the house, and it gets earlier and earlier. But I'm, so I'm, I'm doing that. Um, I'm also really interested in the signs and shops. So like Andrew, I've been writing those down, whether I'm going to do anything. I might not bother now, I've heard Andrew do it well. I think, oh, well, it's been done now, you know. So um, that's me and that's the sort of thing that I do. Um, I was wondering what to read and I thought of this piece called Friday Piece, which I haven't read for years. It was commissioned years ago for this quite sort of zany um, edition of a Canadian magazine called Rampike. So it's one of the first um, journals to run a special issue on eco-poetics, which is my great interest. And this issue we were asked particularly to think about dystopian visions of the future and this sense of coming to an end, which I think quite a lot of people have at the moment. And they feel that sense of um, insecurity. And, and sometimes you hear optimists say, you know, this could be a beginning of a new relationship with the environment, which it makes me feel very hopeful, um, which is when I, how I tend to feel when I'm out with the bird song in the early morning. And then other times, you know, obviously it feels a little bit apocalyptic. So I think that's why I wanted to read from this piece. Um, the context in which it was written, it was written shortly after the Sheffield floods, which um, some of you will remember in June 2007. Uh, it's got some found text, which is largely from the Network Rail site. Uh, it's a little bit from William Morris. Uh, there's a few slogans in there. There's a bit of a sort of dystopian um, material. But it's also focused on my um, train journey. I'm quite missing my train journey, That because uh, I live in the South Pennines, I get the train um, from Penniston into Sheffield. I'm quite missing that train journey. It's a very interesting train journey, and that was one of the origins of this piece, Friday piece. And I think I also wanted to read it because we're thinking now about travel, we're thinking about getting away, but perhaps we're thinking differently about getting away at the moment than we might have thought before. And we're also considering about considering whether, you know, this lockdown will bring some kind of change in our um, relationship to the world and to the environment. So um, it's quite a long time, so I'm just reading part of it. Friday piece. Convolvulaceae. Members of the family are well known as showy garden plants, e.g. morning glory, and as troublesome weeds, e.g. bindweed. Come on, children. It's tidy up time, tidy up time, tidy up time. Morning glory, tender morning, climbing into autumn, falling beyond her season, winding and clasping where she can, up, up to her spectacular sun. Sheffield, after the flood, bindweed straggling over the post and railing, 
mud silting the street, barriers fell at the football ground. Apply the canary test. It soon tells you when it's too late. Start with the coral reef, the canary in the global coal mine, a fine metaphor with a grand historical heritage. Create, create, create a carbon market, a brand new capitalist enterprise. Waiting for the morning train, frost on the oak leaves quiet, bindweed falling to frost at last on the station, autumn waiting to go. Each autumn, thousands of tons of leaves fall on the railway line. A mature lionside tree has between 10,000 and 50,000 leaves, waiting to stop momentum. Thousands of tons of leaves fall onto railway lines each year. Child's wail cuts through suburban garden fences, separation, separation, separation. There are 21,000 miles of track to keep clear, one on one on one. The cost of lineside vegetation management, pruning and felling of trees is between £20,000 and £50,000 per mile. Floor facing each way. Autumn costs the railway industry approximately £50 million per year, including £10 million for vegetation management. 25 million for autumn tree-borne operations, 5 million for hotspot teams and other staff costs, 10 million for damage to trains and tracks from leaf fall. Trying to discriminate, discriminate, don't systemize, don't centralize, learn to make things disappear. We can simplify our lives. The River Don churns mud up. Tree trunks, branches weighed down into water, we long, thin, lit rush through it, all our little round spotlights gleaming over the June dim windows, lit windows, lit windows, lit windows, gleaming electric, until black cloud banks still drawn dropping. Purple buddleia, the butterfly plant, bursts between torn up tracks, excavate, excavated sites, trees, grabbed down from steep, steep banks and slopes as the cranes crawl beside building, beside building desirable resident, resident riverside residences. Capitalise, capitalise, don't forget to advertise. So glad we went to Spain this year to see the sun shining in its morning glory through the Bougainvillea, get away from all of this rain. They're all buying in, a glee, a glow, with approbation from above, a glow, a glee, with bright blue shiny swing pools, a fine ride time away on a jet airplane, riding high through the atmosphere, shooting lines through the pale, pale sky. Getting away, getting away from the robin, the schoolyard gate, the light responsive office, the September cobwebs, the house, the calendar, the ripening apples, the mother on the phone, the washing, the season, the people, the hills coming and going under the weather, life as it goes on living. The unexamined life is not worth living. Globality, the world will become its own empire. Riches galore, even more shall be ours. I look forward very much to seeing this effort to perform or accomplish something, attempt the trial of the future. Being on the two-bit train where it crosses the M1, first motorway in Britain, 60s dream of fast flow, green on blue, on red, on silver, stuck fast, slow move, stuck fast, slow move rush hour below, where wild roses and graffiti sprawl the wall, Roof triangles of the back-to-backs push on to Barnsley Junction. The old world jagger judders on, two carriages over the viaducts, casting its toy shadow on Peniston's green sward scrub. 
and we can see ourselves scorning steel and grass five speeds and climate control as we rattle over the tops through the tunnels sound builds into emergency no end stop to this moment momentum tree train tunnel through ferns lens up through leaves we look or ditto down banks fall away vertiginous scape shift attempting straight course through hilly terrain all over england tin baths enamel sinks our domestic detritus out of which cows drink under plastic tatter flags through tree tunnel leaves to the close-walled city the don her river which city slice roof tiles cranes brick banks of windows channeled by x industries into the new millennial zone bright interchange on our old rolling stock who wants it i think i'll stop there thank you very much uh, we'll pass <laughs> uh, we'll pass on to connor o'callaghan i'm unmuted yes i am um, hi, my name is Connor O'Callaghan and I teach fiction. I did once upon a time teach poetry, but I now teach fiction and non-fiction. Um, I'm conscious of being the last reader. I once went to a, a, a gala reading in Dublin in which Toni Morrison was the last of seven readers. And she came to the microphone at 10 to 11 and read for an hour and, uh, an hour and 30 minutes. Um, it was painful, to be honest, but it was also kind of massively impressive. I remember as a young writer f being blown away at how, how seriously she took herself as a writer. And there was nothing remotely apologetic about the way in which she stood there for an hour and a half reading. This is not a preface to me saying I'm going to read for an hour and a half, don't worry. I'm going to stick to my eight minutes or seven minutes as it is now. Um, what to say about myself? Um, yeah, I teach narrative. I'm obsessed for those students who have been in my class. I'm obsessed with time, the way in which stories are structured around the core element of time. And I suppose the other thing that I try and teach my students just to break it down and keep it really simple is to try and get my students to produce the best work that they can possibly produce. I think the ultimate happiness for any writer is to know that when you put work out into the world, you know you've maxed out that you couldn't do any better. That this is the, the best possible writing that you can do. I'm going to read a very small excerpt from a novel that was due to be published on April the 30th and then wasn't. Um, it is going to be published in February of 2021. Um, I remember that the Irish writer Flann O'Brien published his first novel at Swin Two Birds in the summer of 1939, sold 100 copies and then Wharf came down and all his novels were put into a, the box of Longman's publishers, which was then bombed. And the, the novel completely disappeared until the mid 1960s. Um, at Swim Two Birds, he also had written at that point The Third Policeman and again didn't publish it until the 19th, until the mid 1960s. So I suppose I should be grateful that my book is coming out next year. Um, okay, I'm going to read this quickly and then we'll have questions. It's about a narrator's set in the east coast of Ireland and it's about a narrator's relationship with his late mother. That's a bit racy, but what the hell. Um, that summer would be my last at home. I cadged fags from Kitty's handbag and drank cider on the prom of the nearest village in the weekend darks and slept to all hours. The last week of August, last of summer turned dirty. A succession of squalid skies renewed themselves from the western side of the links. The temperature dipped 10 degrees. Seas turned high and choppy. I mooched around the arcades, I caddied in the rain and blew the couple of quid I made on silk cut, ostensibly for our mother. 
there was one evening in particular. We had tea, pickled beetroot and cut meats and bread pre-buttered. Kitty suggested a dip. I thought she was joking. She wasn't joking. Go on, so I said. We ran all the way. The tide was right up against the dunes. It was churning peat brown like ale. A few yellow pinhead lights along the coast. We raced into the breakers and screamed and felt freer and wilder than either of us probably had before then or did after. Out of the water, I asked, want me to dry? Too cold for that, she said. We'll catch our deaths. She threaded the black straps under her arms, knotted the towel across her and held her swimsuit, let her swimsuit bundle at her feet. She lifted it off the shingle with one hand, towel held in place with the other, and started towards the house. I took off my togs. I followed her through the dunes. Her towel drooped to her lower back. The slow rise to our garden, the shells underfoot, the gap in our hedge. As she approached the French windows to the living room that we had left open, and dissolved from the last of the light into the interior's absolute black. She let the towel fall all together on the patio's pebbled concrete. There were no lamps lit downstairs, no answer when I called her name. Kitty. I went up with my old towel held against me. I could hear the hairdryer humming in her womb across the landing. I went into my bedroom and left the door ajar. I spread the towel on the end of my bed and sat back on its damp. Of her skin, I was thinking of those dark hollows, the inkling of bristle. The hairdryer stopped. I could hear her carpet dragging her handful of footsteps. Are you there? I could see the shadow of her profile on the wall just inside my door. Nose, throat, the pouch of her slight breast. I wanted her to come in. I wanted her to see how I had grown. I said nothing. I could hear a gale getting up. I could hear her held breath at the center of that. Are you there? Three times she asked, and three times I couldn't respond. Are you in there? There was nothing I could say, however much I wanted to. Her shadow backed off, leaving only the straight line of the door's edge on my wall's barely differentiated gray. Her carpet dragged once more, and again some minutes later. Next thing, was the kitchen singing its kettle's song, the wireless beeping its nine o'clock bulletin. Done. Oh, Do thanks. <laughs> thanks very much, Connor. And thanks everyone. Uh, it's been a really um, rich reading. It's been great, actually. Really enjoyed it. It's been wonderful to see you all again. 